Thank you so much, Kathy, for uh, organizing this amazing meeting and also having me uh, be a part of it. Uh, it's a really diverse uh, group that you've assembled, and I've actually never met any of the other uh, uh, speakers uh, in today's program. Uh, so my, my laboratory focuses entirely on mitochondria, and uh, after providing you with an extremely brief introduction uh, to uh, uh, our lab sort of uh, focus and approach, uh, I'm going to share with you some of our more recent work that I think actually does fit very much in lines with uh, the theme uh, of this conference. Um, and so uh, we focus on this organelle that we've already heard a little bit about uh, today, uh, mitochondria. Uh, and this is what most of you are probably familiar with from your high school or college biochemistry uh, classes. Uh, and now if you actually visualize mitochondria with uh, a green fluorescent protein, for example, and make a movie, what you'll see is that this organelle is constantly swimming inside of each of our body's cells. They're fusing, they're dividing, they're moving around. They look almost like intracellular bacteria because, of course, you know, more than a billion years ago, these mitochondria probably were free swimming uh, 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 bacteria, probably resembling something like modern day gram negative rods. Now we know what the chief functions of this organelle are. Uh, they break down uh, the food that we eat, they harvest the energy uh, that's uh, in our food, and then as they break down all of the food that we eat, the end products are then used for things like growth and proliferation. <clears throat> now, these organelles still retain a vestige of their bacterial ancestry. This is what's called the mitochondrial DNA. Uh, and this is actually what a lot of people will equate with this organelle. If you're clinically trained, the answer to almost every single question on your board exams about mitochondria is maternal inheritance. Right? And that's simply not true. This organelle is super important. It was sequenced almost 20 years exactly before the rest of the human genome would be sequenced. It's very important, but it only encodes 13 proteins total. There are 13 very, very important proteins. All of the other machinery, uh, protein machinery, is actually encoded by the nuclear genome. So I had done my postdoc uh, in uh, genomics uh, as well as in proteomics, and I was an early adopter of both of these technologies to try to systematically identify all of the components coming from the nuclear genome that are required to manufacture mitochondria. And uh, uh, over the last 15 years, my laboratory has really been trying to establish the mitochondrion as a system, if you will. Uh, we have been trying to approach this organelle in a very systematic way, typically using the new tools of genomics and proteomics. And over the last 15 years, some of the things that we have done uh, 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 aims at trying to understand this organelle so that one day we could even try to model it. Now, the analogy that I like to use, uh, a, a car is a very reasonable metaphor for uh, an entire cell. And I grew up in southeast Texas in a small town called Beaumont, and my uh, brothers were actually real big car fans, and I was the youngest, and so they would always have me help them fix these old cars that they would buy. And whenever we would go and buy an old car, the very first thing that we would do is we'd go to a store called AutoZone and we would buy a Chilton manual, a manual that corresponds to the year and make of your vehicle. So if you have a 1965 Mustang, you get a Chilton manual for a 1965 Mustang for an inline six or for a V8. Um, and then as you open up the pages of this booklet, the first few pages literally lay out all of the parts of your car. Then the next few chapters are all dedicated to wiring diagrams. And the last few chapters are all dedicated to how do you actually debug your car when it's not working properly. So to some extent, our lab's goal has been to build a Chilton manual, if you will, for mitochondria. And over the years, uh, we have uh, uh, used proteomics and genomics and computation to identify all of the protein components that make up our mitochondria. So there's about 1,000 proteins total coming from the nuclear genome that make this spectacular organelle. We've been using a lot of big data approaches, uh, a lot of machine learning approaches, uh, and genomic approaches to try to understand how these components wire up with each other into pathways and complexes. And we combine these circuits with uh, uh, human genetic studies to find individual components or even circuits that are actually altered both in rare diseases and in common diseases. And the ultimate goal is to somehow use these insights to devise new therapies for mitochondrial dysfunction. <clears throat> 
Now, at the heart of this uh, uh, organelle um, is something called uh, the electron transport chain, which supports oxidative phosphorylation. Now, I want to just focus a little bit on this system. This is probably the best studied system within the mitochondrion, and it's already been alluded to a few times during this uh, symposium. And so this is uh, a cartoon of oxidative phosphorylation. It resides in the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. There's about 90 proteins coming both from the mitochondrial genome as well as from the nuclear genome. Uh, that form the system, and you need literally scores of other proteins to assemble this properly. Now, oxidative phosphorylation is an amazing innovation uh, because what it allows you to do is it allows you to harvest a huge amount of ATP from a single molecule of glucose by using the special chemistry of oxygen. So whereas glycolysis yields about two ATP per glucose molecule, by using oxygen, uh, you can actually produce more than 30 ATP per molecule of glucose. Now, uh, you could ask, if you have oxidative phosphorylation, why would you ever not use it? And the reason why it may not make sense to use it sometimes is because of the trade-offs. So the yield is much higher with oxidative phosphorylation. However, it's kinetically slow. Um, it requires oxygen. Uh, and you also have to maintain entire mitochondria. More than 1,000 different proteins, as well as our homeostasis, uh, are required to support this pathway. And so uh, each cell in your body is almost programmed, if you will, to rely uh, either on oxphos or glycolysis or some relative balance. So for example, neurons uh, love to use oxidative phosphorylation. And cancer cells, which have very high proliferative requirements, love to use glycolysis even when there's plentiful oxygen. And this is what's been called the Warburg effect. And I think that this is uh, an extremely important uh, theme. Uh, and others, including uh, our second speaker this morning, actually alluded to the possibility that perhaps shifts in metabolism may be important for this relationship between neurodegeneration and cancer, and something that I certainly uh, believe in as well. So uh, our laboratory is very interested uh, in the fundamental biology of this organelle, uh, but we're also very interested in the disorders that arise from defective mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation. And as it turns out, not all types of mitochondrial dysfunction are the same. Uh, it's very nuanced. The type of mitochondrial dysfunction that you get in response to a toxin can be very different from that inside of a monogenic disease. And that can be very different from a common disease. But I wanted to at least walk you through the spectrum. And so uh, some of the disorders that we focus on in our laboratory are uh, rare monogenic disorders. They can either be Mendelian in inheritance or maternally inherited. Uh, and they are typically syndromic. They actually impact multiple organ systems. So some of these patients will have blindness, they'll have white matter disease, they'll have gray matter disease, they'll have cardiomyopathies, and they'll have diabetes. Um, and then other of these patients with these monogenic disorders may only present with a single organ system. We don't fully understand the logic of tissue-specific pathology. And I'm just showing you one of perhaps the most severe manifestations of monogenic mitochondrial uh, disorders. This is something called Lee syndrome. This is uh, a subacute neurodegeneration of either the brainstem or the basal ganglia. This is a terrible, terrible infantile uh, disorder. Uh, and there's more than 75 different genes that can underlie this uh, disorder. Now, these are relatively rare diseases, uh, and they're very severe. Now, if we move along the spectrum, we have disorders such as Parkinson's disease. Uh, and we've already heard a beautiful uh, uh, talk this morning about Parkinson's disease. It can come either in sporadic flavors or in monogenic flavors or in uh, uh, toxicant flavors. And some of the toxins that cause Parkinson's disease in humans are direct poisons to this oxidative phosphorylation system. Some of the Mendelian forms of mitochondrial disease are due to mutations in genes that encode mitochondrial proteins that impact oxidative phosphorylation. And even in the sporadic forms of uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, Anthony Shapira showed more than 30 years ago or so that if you actually sequence that mitochondrial genome, there's actually an excess of mutations in the mitochondrial genome in even the more common form of Parkinson's. And then if you just go to uh, the aging process itself, if you actually sample the substantia nigra uh, 
from individuals of advanced age and you sequence their mitochondrial DNA, you'll actually see increased prevalence of mtDNA mutations, often disabling mutations in individuals of advanced age, even when they don't have Parkinson's disease. And so there's an entire spectrum of mitochondrial dysfunction from the rare to uh, uh, the very common. Now, one of the big challenges is that we have no effective therapies right now for combating mitochondrial dysfunction. And in particular, for these rare diseases that we focus on, we don't have a single proven therapy. So for years, we've actually been using a high-throughput genetic strategy to try to find suppressors. And starting in the, uh, probably around 2009, 2010, we were actually trying to do RNAi screens along the following lines. When we poison the oxidative phosphorylation system with a small molecule, cells, human cells, will exhibit a proliferative defect. And our dream had always been to find an RNAi, which if we eliminate a gene, it would now suppress that toxicity. And a very talented former postdoc in the laboratory spent, he spent quite a bit of, actually I spent quite a bit of money doing lots of RNAi screens that actually didn't yield any uh, reproducible results. And so we kind of uh, had set that project aside. And two things happened. A talented new graduate student joined the laboratory, Isha Jane, and the CRISPR revolution was happening. And so she was daring enough to revisit this exact same problem, now not using RNAi, but using CRISPR. And so uh, we obtained an early version of the genome-wide uh, CRISPR library from Feng Zhang's laboratory at the Broad Institute. And these are 65,000 different guides that target 18,000 human genes. And so each gene is knocked out in one of three or four different ways. And the hope is, uh, can we find a gene that we can knock out and the cells can still proliferate even though they're bathed in a really nasty mitochondrial poison? So it's a tall order, but that's what we're hoping for. So usually when you do a genome-wide screen, the most typical result is you get zero hits. That's what happened to the previous postdoc. Um, the next most likely scenario is that you get about 700 hits, and you end up having to make up a story as to why you're writing a paper about genes number 94 and 98. Uh, the best case scenario, the most unlikely scenario, is that you get a single solid hit. And in this particular case, this is exactly what happened. These are the 65,000 different guides. They're rank ordered. The y-axis is that arrow, the level of suppression, the level of rescue, if you will. And uh, shown in red are all of the guides corresponding to one particular gene. So if you look closely, guides number one, two, and three out of 65,000 all correspond to the exact same gene. Okay, this gene is something called VHL, and I'll talk about it in a second, but this is like the Michael Phelps of this genetic screen. Right? Not only is it the gold medalist, there actually is no silver medalist and there is no bronze medalist. There's only Michael Phelps, right? It's the only real hit. So um, we got really excited because there was such a strong hit. So what is BHL? And I think this is why uh, if Kathy had invited me to this conference, say, three years ago, I could have spoken about this topic from a theoretical perspective. But now I think perhaps we may have something a bit more uh, 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 practical. So VHL stands for something called von Hippel Lindau. It's a gene that encodes a tumor suppressor gene on chromosome 3. Uh, and inherited mutations in VHL lead to an autosomal dominant uh, cancer predisposition syndrome that's associated with the formation of cysts in tumors. Uh, and uh, somatic mutations in VHL actually uh, are a relatively common genetic cause of uh, a particular type of renal cell cancer called uh, clear cell uh, uh, carcinoma. So what is VHL? VHL is actually a protein. It encodes uh, a ubiquitin ligase that's a part of our body's hypoxia response pathway. So let me tell you about our body's hypoxia response pathway. So there's a transcription factor called HIF1-alpha. It's a transcription factor that wants to go into the cytosol, bind to DNA, 
and it wants to turn on that other metabolic pathway, glycolysis, that I introduced earlier. So this is what HIF1-alpha wants to do. It wants to go into the cytosol. It wants to turn on glycolysis. However, it's regulated in a really interesting way. If oxygen is present, this cannot happen. Whenever oxygen is present, this protein gets hydroxylated by this enzyme, PHD2. That hydroxylated protein gets recognized by VHL, the hit from our screen, which is a ubiquitin ligase. VHL then decorates this protein with ubiquitin. Now this protein gets degraded. So the logic of the pathways is as follows. The transcription factor is made and destroyed. It's made and destroyed. It's made and destroyed as long as oxygen is around. As soon as oxygen levels drop, it is stabilized. Now it can do its job. It can go into the nucleus, and it turns on glycolysis, which is what you want to be on when you don't have oxygen for pathways such as oxidative phosphorylation. So hopefully this makes sense. And uh, VHL is actually mutated in some cancers so that this pathway can be turned on even in the presence of oxygen. This is what's called aerobic glycolysis or the Warburg effect. It's a pathway that is exploited metabolically by a number of different cancers. The way that these cancers do it is by knocking out themselves VHL. So our screen identified loss of VHL as protective against mitochondrial poisoning. It kind of makes sense. It made a lot of sense to us. If you have a broken mitochondria, it can't make its ATP by oxidative phosphorylation, but oxygen is around. So as long as oxygen is around, you can't access that other pathway. And so what ends up happening is knockout of VHL tricks the cell into thinking that it's hypoxic, even when it isn't, and it turns on glycolysis. And so it actually made a lot of logical sense, and so we were really, really excited. And so we wanted to test this idea a little bit more, and we wanted to see if we could somehow manipulate the hypoxia response in different ways and still alleviate mitochondrial dysfunction. Now, we were really excited because as we were reading about this pathway, we saw that there's a drug called Fibrogen that's in phase three clinical trials. Now, what I haven't told you is that this is the same pathway that turns on erythropoietin. And erythropoietin is a billion dollar market, and there's, a, there's several companies that are trying to get some of that market share. And so one of the strategies is to have a small molecule that hits this enzyme that'll turn this on with the idea of boosting erythropoietin. Now, um, we wanted this drug not for that purpose, but to turn on the hypoxia response. But the challenge is if a company has a drug in phase three clinical trials, they are often reluctant to share that molecule with academics uh, in the event that there's an untoward side effect. Um, but we decided to Google FG4592, and this is what we got. A drug hits cycling before it hits the market. As it turns out, the cyclists, in this case, a particular Chilean uh, cyclist, is actually using FG4592 as a doping drug. Okay. So I think it's amazing that he and his doctor read the literature well enough to know that this is even a possibility. But what's perhaps equally impressive is the fact that the anti-doping agency knows to be looking for this drug. Right? And so we're trying to figure out how we can get our hands on this drug. It's unlikely we're going to get it from Fibrogen, but he's getting it somehow. <laughs> so we ought to be able to get it somehow. So as it turns out, a lot of these chemistry companies, once a co compound is published, uh, they'll manufacture it and make it. So we buy it probably from the same person that he buys it from. <laughs> so we got this compound, FG4592. And in fact, in our cells, uh, what we could do is we could actually poison our cells in different ways at complex one or at complex three of the OxFos system. Uh, and we're able to induce the expression of the glycolytic enzymes by adding this compound. So this drug allows the normoxic stabilization of this transcription factor, and it allows us to turn on this glycolytic pathway. Um, we took this compound, and we added it to two different cell types, uh, uh, and we poisoned the cells in three different ways. 
One of the challenges of these mitochondrial disorders is that they're genetically heterogeneous. Some of these patients have defects at complex one, some have it at complex three, others have it at complex five. So we can poison our cells in any of three different ways, and we get proliferative defects. However, if this drug is on board, we can suppress those proliferative defects. So it looks like this may be a relatively general way of suppressing mitochondrial toxicity. So we're really excited by these cellular studies, but the really important question is whether this idea of activating the hypoxia response may work in an accurate genetic model of mitochondrial neurological disease. And so the disease that uh, I've always wanted to try to work on is Lee syndrome. So for, uh, for these last 15 years, we've identified a number of different nuclear genes that underlie Mendelian forms of Lee syndrome. This is a terrible, terrible uh, disease. It's the most common pediatric manifestation of mitochondrial disease. It's characterized by these uh, very deep uh, uh, gray matter lesions that are bilaterally symmetric. And they can be picked up non-invasively by T2-weighted MRI. Um, uh, they impact about one in 40,000 live births. And as I said earlier, there's more than 75 different genes, both in the mitochondrial genome as well as in the nuclear genome that can underlie these disorders. Uh, and at present, we don't have a single proven therapy. So about 10 years ago or so, Richard Palmiter here in Seattle uh, actually gifted the world of mitochondrial medicine with a beautiful and accurate mouse model of mitochondrial disease. He knocked out NDFS4, which is a nuclear subunit for complex one of that oxidative phosphorylation system. Uh, and these mice, right around, uh, starting around day 40 to 45 or so, they develop these same types of lesions on MRI, so they can actually be picked up non-invasively. And then defects in the electron transport chain or respiratory chain ultimately lead to respiratory failure. So because of the uh, nature of the brain lesions, they'll actually stop breathing and they'll die. So these mice are uh, uh, losing weight, they're hypothermic, and they typically fulfill euthanasia criteria around day 55 or 60. And so we wanted to be able to do something to uh, uh, help these mice uh, inspired by uh, this work. And so the question is, how can we activate the hypoxia response and will it somehow prevent this disease? So how can we do this? Well, we could try to use CRISPR. We could try to cross this mouse to some sort of a VHL mouse, but VHL losses embryonic lethal. We'd have to do Cree locks with a tamoxifen, with a tamoxifen inducible Cree. It would be a little bit complicated. Um, we actually were excited about this compound because it's in phase three clinical trials, and we started to dose escalate until we saw penetration into the CNS. But by the time we got CNS penetration, the mice were actually dying from polycythemia. So they're actually developing too much blood and dying. And so this was basically an on-target uh, toxicity. So that was not gonna work. So the question is, how can we activate the hypoxia response in a mouse? How can we activate the hypoxia response in a mouse? This pathway has not evolved so that it can respond to somatic lesions in VHL or FG4592. The pathway has evolved to respond to fluctuations in the environment. When any of you decides to climb up to Pikes Peak, for example, or if some of you have gone to base camp, for example, in the Himalayas, this pathway is gonna get activated. So we have the ability to activate this pathway simply by reducing the environmental oxygen. And so that's what we decided to do. And uh, what I'm gonna show you is a video. These are five mice. This is around day 55 or so, so they're on the brink of death at this point. Out of the five, two of them have been living at base camp for the last two weeks. So two have been treated with hypoxia for their previous two weeks. Look at what happens. <laughs> 
hopefully this is totally obvious. We were totally floored by the results. The lab manager basically came and asked me if there's been some sort of a genotyping error. Um, we genotyped over and over again, and in fact, all of these are missing uh, uh, NDEF-S4. Uh, the mice look really good. They're moving around, and they look uh, uh, more robust. So typically, these mice will die at about, starting at about day 55 or so from their neurological disease. Now, if they're living at 11% instead of 21%, this is what happens to their survival. So this was at the time of publication, which was uh, last year. We've been able to carry the study out further. These mice are typically living to be about 300 days of age or so. A typical mouse uh, lifespan is about two years or so. So it's not a full cure, but they're living to be about 300 days of age or so, whereas uh, the mice with the neurological disease are dying at, a, dying at about day 60 or so. Um, this is not simply uh, metabolic depression and an extension of lifespan. This is actually a dramatic improvement in health span as well. These mice become extremely hypothermic by day 50. If they're breathing hypoxic air, they're basically, uh, their body temperature is normalized. You could see from the video that they're much bigger, so they're actually able to put on mass. Uh, and you don't need these beam breaks to know that they're moving around. Decided to look at some uh, molecules. And so uh, when healthy people or healthy mice are subjected to low oxygen, they should bump their hematocrit. And in fact, both the wild type and the mutants are able to boost their hematocrit, showing that we have exposed them to hypoxia. The rescue looked so good, we were actually concerned that there was a trivial rescue of the OXFOS system. There's about 90 different subunits that make up the oxidative phosphorylation system, and some of those subunits have paralogs that are under the control of low oxygen. And so Richard Palmiter had knocked out NDEF-S4. It's formally possible that there was an NDEF-S4-like protein that nobody had ever reported before, and all that was happening was that hypoxia was turning on and complementing the one protein that had been deleted. But in fact, whereas the wild types have normal complex one activity, knockouts are missing that complex one activity at normoxia or at hypoxia. So that is not the reason. Uh, these mice still have an injured OXFOS system. It's just that they're able to survive without it. Um, in uh, work from our laboratory, we've identified alpha hydroxybutyrate as an interesting circulating disease biomarker. And it actually goes down in the plasma of these mice with hypoxia. And for reasons that we don't understand, well, we understand why lactate goes up in patients and in mice with OXFOS disease, uh, but hypoxia actually causes the lactate to go down. And I'm happy to talk to you about that uh, afterwards. We don't fully understand that, uh, but the disease markers are improving. And uh, importantly, uh, these Lee's lesions, if you actually stain them uh, for activated microglia, you'll actually see them uh, uh, light up uh, nicely. Uh, and this neuroinflammation is not there uh, if the mice have been treated with uh, hypoxia. And so uh, by all measures, uh, these mice are doing much, much better if they're living uh, under hypoxic conditions. So what's the mechanism? Uh, and so since hypoxia seemed to improve these mice, we decided to ask what happens if we simply reduce, uh, increase the oxygen, I'm sorry. Um, and when we uh, increase to 55% oxygen, this is a level that all of you and healthy mice ought to be able to tolerate. When a mouse has a broken mitochondrion, they're highly sensitive to high oxygen. They die within a few days. And as soon as we published this paper, within a few days, I received phone calls and emails from five different clinicians from throughout the world that have seen patients with mitochondrial disease. And they actually shared with me just individual vignettes. They're all vignettes of patients that had been treated with hyperbaric oxygen, so extra high doses of oxygen. Uh, and those patients actually fared very, very poorly. Within 24 hours, those patients either went comatose or had died or went blind. Uh, and so I think the data from our mice corresponds to anecdotes uh, that I've heard uh, in human patients. So we think that hypoxia is working by two mechanisms. One is, as a, as a signal, we think that the low oxygen is turning on adaptive programs like glycolysis, other things as well, but glycolysis is one of them, that promote survival when oxygen is not available to fuel mitochondrial ATP production. We think that oxygen is also a substrate 
for reactive oxygen species in a broken electron transport chain, and that by reducing the oxygen, we're actually reducing the amount of ROS in the electron transport chain. And what I'll note is that while antioxidants may reduce this type of stuff, antioxidants are gonna do nothing to the signaling toxicity that we think is happening. So hopefully these two uh, make sense. <clears throat> And um, just in the final few minutes, I want to just share with you some very, very new uh, results from our laboratory. So what I told you is that the mice in the video were living uh, at 11% oxygen, which is base camp of the Himalayas, and it actually prevented the onset of disease. But usually when these patients actually arrive to us, uh, they're already very sick and they already have advanced disease. So the holy grail has been to try to reverse neurodegeneration. So the question is whether hypoxia can reverse uh, uh, these lesions. And so these mice uh, go through a very stereotyped uh, course, so right around day 55, they're losing their body weight, their temperature is low, they're very sick. Um, and now we're gonna begin the hypoxia after the disease is already onset. And what we're seeing is a remarkable rescue they're actually regaining their body weight. They're moving around. We can do MRIs on these mice. And whereas early on, they had these lesions, by about three to four weeks, we can't even see the lesions on MRI. We can sacrifice the mice at that point. We don't see any uh, microglial activation uh, a few weeks later. Uh, so we actually think that, uh, at least in this particular mouse model, uh, we can indeed uh, reverse uh, uh, mitochondrial neurodegeneration. And so I want to just sum up. Um, mitochondrial dysfunction underlies a spectrum of neurodegenerative diseases, ranging from the very rare to uh, uh, not so uh, rare uh, to the common. Um, what we have found through our screening efforts is that activation of the hypoxia response, and this is actually a pathway that is exploited by many cancers, it's called the Warburg effect, actually alleviates mitochondrial dysfunction. And what's satisfying is it actually makes a lot of logical sense. Uh, and there's probably gonna be a lot of small molecule approaches to activating this pathway, but we're really excited about the idea of actually just using hypoxia itself as a potentially natural way of triggering this program. And in terms of the theme of this meeting, I do think that one of the processes, one of the pathways that may be very important is the relative balance of oxidative phosphorylation and glycolysis. Neurons love to do oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, if they can sort of you know, move the dial a little bit and draw some of their ATP from glycolysis, it could be the case that in the face of a broken mitochondrion, they basically can compensate uh, with some of the ATP from glycolysis. And of course, this is a pathway that's exploited by cancer cells, so that's the potential uh, liability. Where are we headed? Where do we aspire to go? Um, we think that we have a really exciting model for the development of mitochondrial disease and its reversal, and we want to explore its full in vivo mechanism. I told you the screening result uh, that God is here, and I also told you about the model, but the in vivo biology is gonna be far more complicated than what's happening in cells, and so we wanna understand what's happening at a systems uh, level that's giving rise to this rescue. Uh, number two is so far we've only been focusing on these rare forms of mitochondrial disease. Uh, we would love to be able to actually begin to apply hypoxia and some of the other things that we're trying uh, to more common forms of neurodegeneration. And I look forward to talking to some of you in the audience if you have any models of uh, more common forms of neurodegeneration that you might be want, uh, wanting to test. Uh, and then um, finally, uh, we're assembling a team at my hospital that's exploring how to safely and practically translate this concept into humans. Before we can do any studies in patients, I wanna emphasize that we have a lot of work that we need to do in mice and we also need to do safety studies in healthy humans. So we have a lot of work, but there are a couple of things that make me very sanguine about the possibility of using basically inhaled nitrogen uh, as, a, as a potential therapy. First of all, uh, hypoxia is something that's very well studied by the field of altitude medicine. 
in terms of things like PKPD, this has been sort of worked out for hypoxia by folks studying uh, altitude medicine. Number two, the sports industry has created all sorts of gizmos and tents and face masks and uh, equipment to enable athletes to train under hypoxic conditions. So we're actually interested in trying to repurpose what the sports industry has already invented uh, for these patients. So I want to just end by acknowledging the folks that did uh, the work. Um, Isha Jane is the talented graduate student that led uh, the work uh, in my laboratory uh, on the screen as well as on some of the mouse work. We've been fortunate to collaborate with some great people, and in particular, I want to highlight Warren Zapal and his team over at MGH, with whom we've had the pleasure of doing these hypoxia studies in mice. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. So we have time for a few questions. Um, there's one in the back. Yes. Disease condition affects every mitochondria in the cell, uh, and does hypoxia treatment also affect every single mitochondria in the cell, or is it going to be a differential with yeah. the different mitochondria there? No, the, these are great questions. So, you know, I didn't go into a, a lengthy introduction to the orphan mitochondrial disorders, but some of them only impact the eye, some of them only impact uh, white matter, others uh, cause multisystemic disease. We don't fully understand sort of the logic of tissue specific pathology of mitochondrial disorders. So, and then number two, whether hypoxia is going to treat only Lee syndrome or whether it's only going to treat complex one deficiency or whether. Um, uh, it'll generalize, we don't know. Um, uh, we're, 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 we're excited about the fact that hypoxia rescues mitochondrial toxicity, whether we poison complex one, three, or five in a dish, but that's in a dish, right? And so we're trying to get additional models now. And my laboratory was not previously a mouse laboratory, but now uh, we're doing a lot of mouse work, and so we're deeply humbled by uh, something called mouse cage costs as well. And so we're, 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 we're trying to keep pace, but uh, each of these models is a tremendous amount of work. Uh, oh, microphone's coming to you. So I'm going to just so to treat these patients, you'll, this is going to be a lifelong thing. Will they have to wear a mask, or is it something that they can intermittently do yeah. to do? So what's the quality of life going to be if they go on this hypoxic treatment? Yeah. No, this is a great, great question, and that sort of that final point was how can we safely and practically implement this? Um, I could imagine that if there's a child that has what's called a Lee's crisis and develops these deep gray matter lesions, it's conceivable that we may be able to admit that patient and perhaps incubate the baby for a few weeks in the hospital to try to reverse the lesion. Weaning the patient off of the hypoxia may be a challenge, and it's something that we're trying to explore um, right now in mice. Uh, and we're trying things like intermittent regimens, whether they may be effective. And you could imagine that depending on which disease it is, maybe we need continuous or intermittent. But that's exactly what we're trying right now. We're trying those things. Uh, one more question. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So remember, these are very uh, rare and heterogeneous disorders, and so it's going to be very difficult to, to do those types of studies. And we need to go down to 11%, which is equivalent of, say, Pikes Peak or Base Camp or certain parts of South America. And so healthy humans can live there, but uh, you know, it's not going to be a, a city like Bombay or New York with lots and lots of people. So I think that study is going to be a little bit challenging to do. Okay. Thank you so much.